The first reading is from Hebrews chapter 12, um, verse 18 to 29. You can find that on page 1211, 1211 of the Bibles. Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. And let's pray as we begin. Father, we praise your name um, for your amazing word. I'm filled with promises that you are faithful to keep. Father, we pray that as we come to your word now, that your Holy Spirit will help me to speak boldly and clearly and faithfully. And we pray that as we listen, your Holy Spirit will help us to listen with um, ears that are keen to hear um, and hearts that are keen to obey. Make us into a people who want to submit to your word into a local church who love your word and want to become holy, more holy all the time, to bring you praise. Amen. Well, what is the church? Um, Nobody has actually really asked me that before. Um, Twelve years as a teacher with a pretty settled staff room um, where no question at all seemed to be off limits. Um, Seven summers... I'm working in a meat factory when I was a student um, where the questions often weren't very polite um, or very subtle, um, but no one ever questioned what the church actually was. Um, Now, why is that? I've been asked many other questions about my faith, but never that one. Why? Well, I think it's because the people around us, um, they all assume that they already know the answer to that question. Um, And they know it by watching um, and listening to Christians, um, as well as to the TV and and the media in general. Does the answer that um, we Christians give to that unspoken question sound a little bit um, like this? What is church? A Sunday service consists of songs sung by the congregation, a reading, an interesting talk, A moment of reflection and an address which sums up the day and hopefully gives us a take-home message. Afterwards, we have tea and cake, well, in Britain anyway, um, to encourage people to stay and mingle with one another. Outside of the event, we organize small groups and other social activities, such as book clubs and choir, peer-to-peer support, and local volunteering. Well, is that a good answer um, to the church question? If it's the only answer um, that our lives are communicating, um, then we need to be careful because that little paragraph actually comes from the website of the Sunday Assembly. 
um, which started off life as the Atheist Church and had a bit of a name change. There's some of the words that I left out um, from the middle of that. I don't think it'd be a great start to my job if I tried to persuade Melvin and Scott to change our home group's names to Smoops. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go for that one. The Sunday Assembly um, is all about making life better for the people that attend, and even making life better for others as well. They have some kind-sounding goals and nice-sounding aims. But all the good bits for the Sunday assembly are all the bits that exclude God. Ultimately, it's all about them. It's all about humanity. There is worship in a gathering like that, um, but it is the worship of self. As we say together in the creed, I believe in the holy universal church, we are pledging allegiance to a church that is not all about us, but is all about Jesus Christ. Through looking at Hebrews 12 tonight, we get to see some of the seriousness and awesomeness of the church that God has built. When we talk about the church, we want to speak of it being gathered by Jesus Christ, around Jesus Christ, and for Jesus Christ. It's only through understanding the church in these terms that we can become true worshipers of God. I believe in the holy universal church well, in true Irish style, um, let's begin with the last word in that declaration. The word church, it just simply means a gathering or an assembly. And in verses 18 to 24 of Hebrews 12, um, the writer sets before us two gatherings. They're both gatherings of God's people. In both cases, the people are churching. Um, they are assembling together to hear from God. So in verses 18 to 21, we read of the people of Israel who've been redeemed from Egypt and being called to assemble before God at Sinai um, so that they could receive the law as God's specially chosen people. But the scene was one which absolutely terrified the people. Confronted with God's voice, they begged for it to stop. We read this in Exodus 20, 18 and 19. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. As the people came before a holy God, their own sinfulness was a huge barrier that meant death to them if they were to get too close. In verse 20 of our passage, we even see that if just an animal was to touch the mountain, um, then it was to be destroyed, and it was to be destroyed by being stoned so that the people could stay at a distance. Their great leader, Moses, even trembled with fear. See, the people of God were churching, but this was a fearful, distant sort of gathering. And then we come to verses 22 to 24. Now let's be delighted in the difference between this gathering and the one at Sinai. Let's read it. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See, where the gathering at Sinai was marked with distance and terror, this gathering, it's full of joy and intimacy. Thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. What a delightful picture of happiness and celebration. 
our music group does a brilliant job, a brilliant job again tonight of leading us. But can you imagine the singing with the thousands upon thousands of angels? And look at those amazing words in verse 23. You have come to God. Where the Israelites pleaded with Moses to stop God speaking to them, and where they cowered away from the mountain in fear of their lives, the people in this gathering get to come right into the presence of the holy God, the judge of all, without any fear and without any hesitation. How can this be? What has happened between these two gatherings of the people of God? How can one set be so constrained and so afraid as they church and the other be so free and so full of joy? Well, the answer, of course, is Jesus Christ. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, buried, descended to the dead, and on the third day, rose again. The church in verses 22 to 24 bears his name. Look at verse 23. It's called the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. And in verse 24, Jesus is the mediator between God and man whose blood sprinkled upon his people transforms everything about their gathering before their God. When Christ died and rose again, the work of salvation was, in Jesus' own words, finished. There was no need for any barriers set up by the law or by the sacrificial system anymore. No need um, to keep people at a distance. God's people are now free to come right into his presence with joy rather than the fear of being destroyed. So the church now is a people who are gathered by Christ. In our other reading in Matthew 16 that Sam did, Peter there acknowledges the true identity of Jesus. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus responds to Peter and his response is that it is on this rock, the identity of Christ, um, that Jesus will build his church. Peter, he's to be a stone that's going to be built into this church. But the church itself is one that will be built on Christ and belong to Christ. So how do you become part of this church? Well, it's simply and solely through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a faith that trusts that your sin has been dealt with on the cross. And it's a faith that acknowledges that Jesus is your saviour king. It's through the gospel that you are gathered by Jesus into his church. I often gather my children into my presence. Now, sometimes it's a pretty solemn gathering um, as I have to deal with who's drawn on the walls or who's pulled whose hair and so on. The children hear my voice calling to them and, well, they come reluctantly and slightly fearfully. That should not be us as a church because we're not standing at Sinai. We are at Mount Zion. So other times I call my kids together um, and they cannot mistake the joy in my voice. They know that something good is about to happen, normally involving parks or sweets or ice cream or some sort of brilliant combination of them all. Um, they come charging down the stairs full of expectation. That should be our attitude um, as we obey Christ's call as he gathers his church. So what does your attitude show about your faith? Um, for some people, church is treated a bit like a university lecture. It's easy to miss if something better comes up. And you can maybe always grab the, the lecture notes online later. Or for others, it's a bit like a staff meeting. This meeting has to happen if I'm going to keep my job, but it is dreaded. Have I done well this week or have I done badly? Or perhaps for you, it's treated a bit more like a football match. 
You come to be entertained after all. You've invested some time and some money in it, so it better be good. Well, I pray for you that the chance to be gathered by Christ into the Father's presence, along with your brothers and your sisters, fills you with joy and hope. That you come along on a Sunday, sprinkled by the blood of Christ, eager to be in the presence of God. That you are gathered by Jesus through the gospel of Christ. Should it make any difference to your attitude to church, whether there are lots of people there or only a few? Whether there are people there your age or not? Whether the music is to your taste or not? Here at St. John's, there's like a noticeable buzz about the place every week. Would you still be as excited to go to church um, on a Sunday morning if you were going to St. Faith's up in Dunswell Village, along with the 10 or 12 pensioners who gather there every week? Well, this brings us to another awesome truth about the church. Um, When we meet together, gathered by Christ through the gospel, we're also gathering around Christ This is why the word Catholic or universal is used in the Apostles' Creed. And this is a truth that should completely transform the way we think about church. Verse 22 in our passage starts with, but you have come to Mount Zion. If your local church is just a group of pensioners meeting each Sunday morning, well, the temptation to discouragement, I guess, could be quite strong. But the truth that the Bible would have us believe, and and actually the truth we regularly declare we believe when we say the Apostles' Creed together, is that in a very real way, when we meet together as a local church in a particular geographical location, we are also already meeting as the church presently gathered around Jesus Christ in heaven. This is sometimes called the invisible church. It's the church that requires us to exercise faith and to lift our eyes up from what we can see to what we have been promised. And Paul tells us explicitly to do this in Colossians 3, 1 to 3. Here's what he says. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Our salvation is so certain. um, Since we are built on Christ and and gathered by Christ. um, That the local church. Gathered through the faithful proclamation of the gospel. The local church is an expression of the heavenly church. Now a good picture of this is of a spider plant. Not a great gardener, but there's a spider plant. Um, A local church is like one of the little flowers um, that is on this plant. It comes from the plant as a whole, um, and it looks just like the plant as a whole, a smaller version um, of the reality. Here's how Melvin Tinker explains it in his Touchy Topics book. No one church is more or less a church than the others. Each congregation of believers gathered by the word of God, is Christ's church. Each one is a visible realization in space and time of the invisible heavenly church that exists in eternity. That's some truth. And so whether there are five or 500 voices singing together on a Sunday morning, we haven't just come to a church building in a particular neighborhood, but also we have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. We have come to God. Whoa, like that is an amazing motivation to keep meeting together. What a courage giving truth to keep proclaiming God's word faithfully. What an encouragement to delight in that small local church as it gathers around Jesus Christ along with and part of the heavenly church. The scale and the scope of the church gathered by Christ and and gathered around Christ, it doesn't leave any room um, for discouragement or defeat. 
Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. So I dare you to get stuck into that truth um, with your unbelieving friends um, the next time they ask you what you did on Sunday. The conversation might end with them shaking their heads and dismissing you as even stranger than they previously thought you were. Um, But your courage and your faith, it might just cause them um, to come and see what all the fuss is about. Well, after being given such amazing and exciting truths, in verses 25 to 29 of Hebrews 12, we're given a stern warning about how we should respond to this. The church is gathered by Christ, by Christ and around Christ, and it is gathered with a great purpose in mind. It's gathered for Christ. Verse 25 to 27 tell us clearly that if we turn away from Christ, then, well, there's no hope for us. Indeed, God promises a day when everything created will be shaken so that only what cannot be shaken is going to remain. Being called by Christ into his church is an incredible act of mercy and grace. And so we must be careful in how we live as God's people gathered Look at verse 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So what's the correct response as Christ's church in a sinful and fallen world? Well, it's acceptable worship. Churches on earth are meant to look like the heavenly church. And so a desire to worship acceptably must mean that everything we do when we come together is done for the sake of Jesus Christ. So as we come together, God's word must be central, both in our gatherings and in our lives. If we go back to Matthew 16, um, Jesus says to Peter, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, those are serious words with ultimate consequences. What is Jesus talking about? Well, the key to the kingdom is the gospel. Local churches must submit always to God's word. The response to the gospel call is either going to bind people eternally or set them free for eternity. The stakes are that high. It's heaven or hell. So the church must not call good bad and bad good. The church must not bow to what culture thinks is right or wrong. The bride of Christ must honor Christ at the expense of honoring the world around And so must hold tightly to God's word and must hold God's word out boldly for all to hear. And we come together under godly leaders who will hold to the word of God. Our attitude to those leaders must be different um, from the normal attitude to leadership in the world where people just love tearing down and they love destroying. Instead, we are called to remember our leaders, to imitate them, to obey them as they submit to God. In Hebrews 13, next chapter, verse 17, it says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. If we're for Christ, we must be for Christ-like leaders. We come together to pray and to praise and and then carry that attitude of delight and dependence out with us into a world that needs to see a Jesus who should be worshipped. And we come together to remember baptism and communion, they're key to the healthy meeting of the local church. They do many things, but one of them is to remind us how we became part of of God's church in the first place and therefore to continue to live by faith in Christ alone. And we come together to learn to be holy. We have a serious call 
to serious obedience. A call that must ring out through everything we do as a gathered people here in Hull. It is a wonderful call. It's the call of a bride being beautifully prepared for her husband. Because one day we're not going to ever need to say the creed again. We won't need to say in faith, I believe in the holy universal church. Because one day we're going to see him face to face. The church gathered by Christ and around Christ and for Christ will be given to Christ and that joyful assembly will never end. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name for the grace and mercy that you have shown in gathering a people who were once your enemies, a people who didn't care about you, a people who wanted to be kings of their own lives. We praise your name that you have gathered a people and sprinkled them with the blood of Christ and then called them to be holy. We praise your name, Father, and that as a local church gathered, we are gathering as part of the heavenly church. What an amazing truth that is. Help us to lift our eyes up in faith and set them there in heaven. Thank you that at the minute we are gathered around Christ. Oh, Father, make us a people who want to bring your word out to the world around, who want to live holy lives, who want to take church seriously because it is the bride of Christ. And we want to honor your name now and forevermore. Amen.